everybody, my name is Chase Pipes and you're watching a Chasing History short. We're hanging out in, in Utah with our good buddy Benson Moss. Benson, thank you so much for having us out. Benson has been a lifelong digger and collector and his specialty is antiques of the Southwest or antiques of the West in Utah and particularly of marbles. So we've got, the, we're in an awesome place with some incredible history and we wanted to talk to Benson about antique marbles. So Benson, tell us about what, well, how, how did you get started and, and what brought on your fascination with digging antique model, or, uh, marbles? When I was a kid, I played marbles a lot. And we played all the games, Pots and Ringsies and, and Chase Ta and all the games. So I grew up with marbles. When I got into high school, I took a uh, quart jar of marbles that I had and kept them with my stuff. And my mother was gracious enough to save them. So I had this quart jar of marbles and I carried them in a, in a chest every move that I made into my married life. And one day I was going through there and pulled them out and I'd just seen some marbles in an antique store and I saw some of the prices <laughs> and I <laughs> says, oh, maybe I got something good here. So I hooked myself up. This is 25, 28 years ago, maybe 30 years ago. And I hooked myself up with uh, um, a guy that wrote the book uh, from uh, Leighton, Utah, Larry Castle and... Uh, and those guys wrote the first handmade book. And I took this jar of marbles over to him and I said, have I got anything here? And he dumped them out on the carpet and he rolled them around. And he says, yeah, you got some stuff here. Do you want to sell it? And I says, is it valuable? And he says, yeah, you got some pretty good stuff here. I don't know, do you want a price? And I said, no, let's don't get ahead of that. I said, I think I'll start collecting. And so I took that that jar of marbles with this jar of clays, which has another story yeah. to it. And and that's what started me. So I never do anything in moderation. <laughs> so I started. And I start chasing marbles. That's awesome. And you can see Chase Chase. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you chased a lot of them. Chased a lot of marbles. See, guys, marbles is a game that we're not really familiar with here in the 21st century, unfortunately, because it's such a fun game to play. But these marbles here, right here, these were played by every kid in every state in every territory across the United States and all over the world. There's actually a marble... Uh, tournament, the World Marble Championship, is held every year uh, somewhere in France. Uh, so marbles were, you know, uh, this hugely popular game that kids played. And of course there were factories that manufactured marbles all across the United States. And of course like any company or any manufacturer, you know, you're going to want to make your marble a little bit different or a little bit more special in order for those kids to want to buy those marbles. And for marble players, if you were playing against a kid who had some of those little better or little special marbles, you want to make sure that you won. Now my grandfather was a marble player, big marble player, um, and he the the deal was, and then you tell me if this was true in, in when you were playing, but whoever won the match got to keep the other kids' marbles. Did you ever play by oh, those? Oh sure, marbles? you can, never played for just. Can to you play. imagine that? <laughs> you would never go out to recess and just play for fun. Yeah, you'd put twenty marbles in a circle, and the marbles you knocked out of that circle would be yours, and it that and there was no just playing for fun. You kept every marble that you won. I would take 10 marbles to school, or 15, and at recess, you couldn't get outside fast enough to start playing marbles. And before school and after school, waiting for the bus or whatever. And I would take 10, 15 marbles, and unfortunately, I'd become a very good marble player. And so I'd come home sometimes with 100, 150 marbles wow. with with a 10 marble, 15 marble initial start. And and when on weekends, when we would play all weekend and just with the neighbor kids and just go, 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 sometimes I'd win three and four hundred marbles a weekend. Wow, you're and kidding. Put them in big coffee cans. 
I had marbles all over, you know. So if you can fathom this, either you as a kid or your kids, you know, with a bag of marbles that you just picked up, you know, going out there and hence the expression losing your marbles, you know. <laughs> I mean, it's it's just hard for us to fathom in this day and time. So how would you get money or raise money to go get some more marbles? Well, I never had to once I started playing. I played on all the other kids. Listen but, to this. <laughs> never. When I started... When I would go to get marbles in the in the early 50s, well, the late 49 and 50 era and that, you go down to the store and you could get a bag of marbles for 10 cents and it would have maybe 30 marbles in or 15 cents. And according to the era that you bought them in would sort of predicate what what company was hot in I lived in Syracuse, Utah, which is right out of Ogden. So whatever they were buying at those shops, those toy shops, and it's, everybody carried marbles in the, every store. You could run down to the drugstore and buy marbles. So you just go down and buy marbles to get started. Once I started playing and got into it at least a year, I never had to ever buy any from the store. I had plenty that I'd won. Yeah. But uh, everybody wasn't that way. There was always the guys that would shoot like a girl. Oh, whoops, excuse me. <laughs> would shoot like a girl like this. And when I'd take a marble and learn to shoot, my dad taught me how to shoot like this. And you can really put some power there. But if you're going like this and flipping your thumb, those kids didn't have a chance. <laughs> and there's so many games. One of my favorite games was called Pots. And you would take about, oh, five feet, six feet apart, and you'd put a, a, pot, a hole in the ground, in the dirt, a hole in the dirt, and then about six feet on the other, straight across, you'd put two more holes, and then you'd put a pot, a pot right in the middle. And you'd say, anybody wanted to play, you could play up to five, six kids, four kids, two kids. You would put... Decide how many was you just going to put in the middle pot. Mm -hmm. So if we decided to put four marbles a piece and there was five of us playing, that that's a pretty good pot. So you start at number one, and you lag, lag on a line to see who's first, second, and third, and fourth. What does that mean, lag on a line? You draw a line out there, and then you take a marble and you oh, throw it okay. to the line, and whoever gets the closest got the first shot. At the first shot, second shot, third shot, fourth shot. So you'd start at pot number one and you'd shoot at pot number two until you got in it. So you were shooting through the dirt. So sometimes we would have the rules that you could shoot up like, like this, mm -hmm. okay? And sometimes the kids didn't like that because I could, I could just get to the pots pretty easy. So they'd want you to start at the line at the pot and go on the ground, which was more hard, harder to get to the pot. Anyway, you'd go around the pot, and uh, your turn, and if you landed in the pot, you got another shot, and and you'd keep going, and the first one back to number one would shoot for the poison pot in the middle, and the once you got your marble in the poison pot, you were poisoned, and you could start chasing the other players. So you'd go after them, and the minute you'd hit them, they're out. And whoever... And two or three people could be poison, you know what I mean? Yeah. Or one or two, and whoever survived and was last man standing got the pot. Wow. <laughs> See, there's a whole lot more to marbles, and th that is just one, That's of, one game, yeah. of, of dozens and dozens and hundreds of different marble games that people played back then. I mean, to talk about a way to, you know, keep people occupied, marbles was definitely a way to do it. So there's all kinds of different manufacturers and stuff and uh, that did came into marbles and you've collected and you've sorted your collection by manufacturers and types would you mind running down kind of what these different types are and and manufacturers and all that and maybe explain to the audience what are what are some good marbles for people to look for for those that are out there that are wanting to start collecting marbles do you want to do that well let me give you a real quick and I'll, I'll keep it quick P, the early cl marble collectors mm -hmm. started collecting handmaids Okay. Handmade marbles was made in, mostly in England and Germany and over there. And there they 
come over and a few people made handmaids in the United States, but it was, most of them come from England and, and the European countries. And they were blown on a cane, like just like you see these uh, glass blowers blow things. Mm -hmm. That's how they do the marbles. Okay. So all of, most all of the original collectors in the early days started out with handmaids. They, they didn't even care about machine-made marbles, you know, like, like these here. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, back in the oh, late 70s, early 80s, people started picking up on the rarer handmade or uh, machine, machine maids. And when I was a kid, you'd, we had names for every marble. And ironically, most of those names are what we call them today. Hmm. that the people that collect marbles call them today. So I started and I would buy handmaids and I'd get them if I run into them and I had a real fairly nice collection. But I started after the rare machine marbles when it first started back 30 years ago when people started collecting machine marbles. And I'll give you a quick, some of the early companies, uh, Christensen Brothers, uh, was the first, and they just made slags. See, uh, trying to pull the initial up. But anyway, Christensen, the first Christensen marbles, they just did slags. And slag is a certain kind of marble that has a nine in it that you can identify by what they made. But everybody made slags eventually. And then, no relation, was another Christensen marble, and they started making handmaids. And they are the most hardest and the most rare, in my opinion, to get a nice collection of Christiansons. Then from Christiansen, Acro Agate, Peltier, uh, Master Marble, uh, Ravenswood, all of these companies started springing up. But the early ones was Acro Agate and Peltier. And the way I did it is I learned what company made the marble and how to identify it. Then I learned the key marbles, the hard to get ones in that company. Hmm. So that's how I learned marbles and they're hard. Marbles is not an easy thing. I, I hate to throw that onto your arms. No, it's true. But I mean, but I mean to, to become a good expert and grab a marble and say, oh, Akaraka made this 1950s or Akaraka made this in the 30s. And that's hard. What's a trick, like recognizing the patterns? Are there... Well, in books that I'm going to give you, and I'll give you a list of books to get, mm -hmm. will show you how what they made in a certain time period. And okay. it'll show you, like, the like Akaragat would make marbles, and then all of a sudden they made Popeyes. Well, Popeyes today is a sought-after marble. There's quite a few of them out there, but they're fun, and they're harder to find, and they're beautiful. And so people will just collect maybe Popeyes out from Acro Agate. Some people just collect Acro Agate. Some people collect just Peltier. And Peltier back in back in the East, them guys, they're very fanatical about Peltiers. And some of the beautiful Peltiers that come up is just unbelievable. Unfortunately, I have a few of them. And uh, through the years, looking at thousands of marbles, I've created some. Cool. Yeah. Well, let's do this. Can we go and look at some of the some of your other marbles and kind of give people a rundown of what different types are in different companies? Sure. All right. Let's go into my office. Gonna, you're gonna love this office. It is not like this can get any better, but it can get better. So, <laughs> come on, let's go. All right. So, Benson, we've moved into your office, and you've got this incredible showcase of marbles. But there are so many different types. What, what, what is all going on here? How do you know the different types, the different styles? What are the different manufacturers? Just give us a rundown of, of what we got here. Do we, are these older marbles up on top? Yeah. Uh, actually, these are a few handmaids through the, that I've kept through the years. The big ones in the back are contemporary. They're made, modern made marbles. Okay. But very, very artistic made. So these here are the handmade. Right. Correct. So I'll bring it in and let you guys sit. So these are what the early handmade marbles looked like. What what years were they making these? These are all 1800 
from 1850 to 1900, I would say. Okay, and they were blowing them with glass? Yes, they were blowing them with, uh, here's a really a nice sized one that you can put up to the camera. Oh, wow, look at that. So where would these have been made? Uh, European, England, Germany. Uh, there, there are a few of them made in the United States after after the marble makers moved over here. Okay. But uh, a lot of them, most of them, that the real old stuff come from England and Germany and and the uh, Europe's and the old world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The old world. So handmaids are really really important marbles to collect. What about these on uh, these porcelain ones on either side? What are now these are Bennington's here and these are grab just the bigger ones. Grab the bigger ones, yes sir. And these are porcelain with a what did you call it? That's that's a line crockery. A line crockery. Porcelain and that's the way a marble was made. And it's had the line crockery name since forever. That's what we when we were kids mm -hmm. Playing, playing, we'd make them put three or four of those in for every glass marble because they nobody wanted them. But now everybody's looking for, especially the line crockeries is really a hot category right now. Yeah. And the fancy bennies. Now, when were these? When would these have been made? They all, a lot of the Benningtons come from European, from England, and from mm -hmm. Germany. Germany, especially for the Benningtons, and these all come. That's in that early deal, but as the people migrated to the United States, these started to be made in the United States pretty heavily. Okay. More so than the than the handmaids, but still, you know what I'm saying. Okay. Now you get down to the machine-made marbles down here. So when when did the machines come out to actually produce marbles, and what did that process look like? It was right after the 1900s. The early marble, the first machine marbles were called transitions. So they were half machine made and half on a cane. So, so they, the marble would make the, the machine would make the marble, not half on the cane, the machine would make the marble and then it would have a little pontil on the bottom of the marble. Mm -hmm. So they called them transitions. And then the early transitions were on a cane and they had like the end of the day, and they'd have the uh, the the better pondles. They got away trying to smoothen them up. Oh, huh. okay. So that's sort of a transitional okay. situation. So what are the different now, types that we have here? Well, in the early 1900s and in the 20s, 19s, 20s, the Acro Agate and the Peltier companies started to make marbles and competing with each other. This right here, all of these right here, are hard to get Peltiers. Okay, all of these right here. On this oblong mirror. Okay. These are Christensen agates right here. The, the, the second Christensen agates made in the United States. These are, the agate, Christensen agates are some of the most sought after because they're harder to find. Supply and demand. Mm -hmm. Then in the and then on the back, you'll see some great big Benningtons and some big clays. Okay. And that goes along with your fancy Benningtons and your line crockeries. Okay. Okay, Benson, show us some of the Peltier marbles that you were talking about. There's a very, very nice specimen of what we call a Superman marble. Very sought after. The collectors like these Superman marbles. Oh, wow. And the colors are all Superman colors, so that's how it got its name. Yes. And we called them Supermans when we were kids. Cool. Yeah. Uh, this is a Golden Rebel, one of the harder ones to get. That's called a Golden Rebel Peltier. Very nice marble. Now what gives it that name? Where does that name come from? Well, the Golden Rebel is the marbles are rebels, and then when we get the gold going through them, that becomes a Golden Rebel. Okay. This marble here 
is your cartoon marbles. And there's a lot of uh, knockoffs on these. This is an authentic one. And uh, what is this? And this is uh, Herbie. And if you can get a whole set of them and a box, mm -hmm. very, very highly sought after. But very expensive. This is a Peltier slag. And the way you tell Peltier slags, everybody made a slag, but you can identify <clears throat> Peltier slags with the real fine lines. Okay. See how those lines are so fine? Mm-hmm. That's that makes that a Peltier slag. That's a hallmark of that manufacturer. Of, uh, of Peltier. Okay. That makes the slags. This is one form of the rainbow Peltier. This come a little later than the marbles I've been showing you. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's called a ra early rainbow Peltier. Doesn't look very rainbowy. Why does it get the name rainbow? Well, I don't know. It just does. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> because that's its name. Here, and you know how these get... These get... The way you tell a Peltier is it's got a baseball seam right there. Okay. This is a pretty rare rainbow. It even come later than that last All one. All right, I so explain, you. show us the baseball seam. See that seam right there? Every Peltier has that. I mean, the later ones. Okay. Here, here it is. This is a little earlier. This comes right after that one I just showed you, Peltier. Okay. And that's the rainbow line. And they just kept that going through a lot of different styles of marbles. This is the rainbow. But let me get you a good baseball seam to show you. Here's a good one on a... This is called a uh, bumblebee. That's what we called them when we were kids. Mm -hmm. but see that? See that uh, baseball Oh, I line? see it. Yep, and you can just, really see it on and that. And it's on both sides. Yep. But see that right there? Yep. Uneven baseball side? Yep, you can really see it on that. That's there. called a bumblebee, but it's in the rainbow family. Okay. okay. These are pretty hard, or not hard to get, but they're they're good to get. Uh, let me show you uh, uh, some real early Peltiers. I should have maybe showed you these first. These are early Peltiers. That one has the the uh, the baseball seam. Right. But these are early Peltiers, earlier. Now, what type is that called? Well, I don't know. They really had a name. They fall into the rainbow, early rainbow. Mm -hmm. But these are the before everything I showed you. And I got the horse in front of the car, or behind the cart. These I should have showed you first, but that you can maybe switch okay. it around. Can you show us the difference between the Peltier and the other company that's next to it? Just how you can tell the difference between the two manufacturers? Yeah, it's harder. It's harder to to show you a lot of Christians and agates. One of their traits is flames. See the flames? Mm-hmm. And there's other companies that make flames, but the early Christians or some of the earlier Christians have flames. Now this is really. A very nice Christus and agate. See the diaper fold? Mm hmm And how it swirls around from that. That's a beautiful marble. And here's another Christus. <clears throat> this is a beautiful Christus. So how can you tell the difference between a Christensen and let's say an Acro or any of the other companies? You just have to learn. That's just experience. <laughs> just look at them. Right. I and got look you. At the, look at a lot of marbles and look at a lot of books. And that's back to learning what company made what marbles, and then go back and pick out the keys. Wow, so there really is a lot to... <laughs> it's not an easy, easy hobby. But these two are beautiful. Oops, excuse oh, that's me. That's okay. These two are beautiful specimens of Christus and Agates, especially this green one. Wow. That's a gorgeous marble. They're, to find a marble like that, if you were out looking at an antique store or out trying to get marbles, mm -hmm. that'd be a really two great catches. Wow. Right there. 
I'm going to show you real quick a couple of very nice Popeyes in the colors. And if you'll see, all Popeyes have a corkscrew on them. Starts at the top, corks around to the bottom. That's a trademark of Acro Agate. But these particular uh, clear ones, uh, translucent, are... Oh yeah, you can really see the corkscrew yeah, in it. Yeah, they're, they're Popeyes. So that's... They're really sought after. The Popeyes are... People really like the Popeyes. Mm -hmm. Especially if you can get them in the box. Now you take down here, I'll show you a couple of real good corkscrews. This one starts corking at the top and it corks all the way around that marble to the bottom. Any oh, marble wow. that has a corkscrew is an echo agate. Okay. Why didn't, a trademark. Other, why didn't other companies pick up on that or do that? They didn't know how. Oh. It's the guy that created this corkscrew in the agro agate world had a way to do it and it was a secret and nobody could pick it up. There's people that tried and they get broken corkscrews and everything. But look at that bumblebee. How it starts there mm -hmm. and it corks all the way to the bottom. It wraps around the marble. This is a uh, Indian blanket mm -hmm. and it's a double corkscrew, three color. See the cork? It goes all the way around that marble and ends up at the bottom. Mm -hmm. That's a beautiful, beautiful marble. So what's your favorite, if you had a couple favorites that you found, what what would what would you say your favorites are? Well, I can show you a couple over here. Um, oxblood. I'm going to talk real quick about oxblood. Okay. That's another way you tell uh, echo agate, and it's it's a little tricky. It looks like it's painted on. If you look at that blue oxblood. Here, hold it over here. See, it looks like it's painted on. Mm -hmm. It isn't deep in the marble. See this red stripe? That's ox blood, and we call that marble an egg yolk. These are some of the more special acro agates that I like. Here's a semi. See, there's a corkscrew. Mm -hmm. It comes all the way around, and it's ox blood. And and these are these are really really nice marbles. And I did dig this marble. I found this marble in a dump. Oh, wow. And it is one of my favorites. Right here is a solid oxblood marble. Mm -hmm. And they're called bricks. And that's the name of them. And they're solid. Now, why do they call them bricks? Because they're completely solid oxblood. Okay. And the oxblood I showed you just shows that little top painted. Okay. So you have to learn about bricks because these are hard, harder to find. And they're very nice marbles, the bricks. Uh, sparklers. This is another acro agate, and they're sparklers. See how that clear is? Mm -hmm. They're called sparklers. That's just one of the marbles that they made. Okay. And uh, I mean, rather than try to set them back on. Okay, I'm going to grab one each of the Moonies. This is another marble agate made. Oh, wow. They're called Moonies. If you hold this one up to the light, it's going to show yellow. Mm -hmm. If you hold this one up to the light, it's going to show orange. Orange is better than yellow. Why is that? But it's just harder to get okay. the, or the orange color. And it's a little different uh, uh, opaque with the orange in it. And that's another agate okay. marble. Um, and I have, this is called Vaseline uh, Oxblood, Vaseline Oxblood, that's a beautiful marble. Now is that the Vaseline this'll, glass? Yes, you should put that under light and it'll glow like crazy. And it'll glow under UV light. Yeah, and several of those others I showed you. Yeah, will glow. This one, this one right here will glow really well too. Yeah. Yeah. Benson, I cannot thank you for sharing your knowledge with us. This th this has been a treat, man. Now, you know, as marbles, you know, playing the game got less and less popular, you know, these manufacturers had to, you know, ha what happened to a lot of these manufacturers as people quit buying marbles to play? A lot of the companies just went out. Acro Agate, Acro Agate was one of the bigger marble companies and so when marbles started to 
really tapering off and, and that, they start to make an glassware. Now why do you think marble started tapering off? Why do you think the popularity waned? Well, marbles? there's two reasons. Long before they were, were unpopular with kids, the competition got so much that everybody was selling marbles. So it was getting harder and harder to make a living just selling marbles. The early guys, Acro and, and those guys, had the market to themselves early on, Christus and Agate and everything, because they had the early machines that could make them. Mm -hmm. And as people start to get learning and leaving companies and starting companies, that's one reason. But the other reason is kids started backing off a little on marbles. And so Acro Agate decided that they would make other glassware. Okay. So I like what we have here. Yeah. So this is... That's a kid's dish. Wow. That's Vaseline glass with ox blood in. So and if a whole set of this with the tea, the teacups and all, a whole set of this is very valuable. Wow. I mean, that's the most valuable kid set that you can get. So they're basically using the same, the same glass, glass as they were making the marbles. So right. this is the ox blood like you were talking about right. earlier, only they're swirling it into dishware instead of right. into marbles, marbles as a way for the company to survive. Money, to survive. Wow. Then they did this, uh, you can always tell their swirls like on their marbles. Mm -hmm. That set of candlesticks is a pretty rare set of candlesticks. Uh, holders. In order to to purchase these two right here, you know, you're you're looking at uh, $250 to $200. Today. Today. Yeah, today. Yeah. But back to buy them, there's a book out there and I give, I've got it for you to look up that is the Akraga book. Tells you originally what all this stuff cost. Oh, cool. But it's just fascinating that this is what these companies did as a way to way to survive. This vase right here is also translucent. When you run a, a blue light over it, it'll glow like crazy. Mm -hmm. So it's got the uh, uranium in it. Oh, wow. One of these sold on eBay at one time between five and six hundred dollars. Now I'm not saying that was an everyday thing. Mm -hmm. Might have been a fluke. I just happened to have one, so maybe it's a six hundred dollar vase. <laughs> we'll take it. That's all right. <laughs> And, and that's, that's just they did vases, uh, candle holders, dishes, uh, cups, carb uh, po uh, flower pots, mm -hmm. uh, just all kinds of stuff. So how there. long did this last? I mean, how many how many years did this buy the marble companies by making these household products? The war again back when the war started. World War Two. Is, yeah, World War Two. Yeah. Is they they needed to to get more stuff out there to make money. I, I don't know when that actually quit, but there's quite a bit of it out there, and it's very collectible. Probably about I mean, the 60s, you'd think? No, I don't 70s. think it went that long. No, no okay, no, so no. even the 50s. In the, if if Acro Agate, and I should know this, and I apologize, I would say in the 50s, probably, when they quit. Wow. You know, because the war years, they made them through 44, 45, 46, and then it sort of fell apart after that. The marbles didn't. They, mm -hmm. they kept it going. But uh, this might have come a little later after, yeah. after that. Wished I had the exact date for no, it. No, you're good. <laughs> you're, I cannot thank you enough for sharing your knowledge. And I know everybody out there really appreciate it. Marble collecting is a really, really fun hobby that you guys can get involved in if you want to, you know. I mean, there's a really good chance if you go out into your, you know, local county uh, uh, schoolyard or play yard, you can find some of these old marbles that these the kids play with. The old dumps are a great place to go find this stuff. You'll never, even old creek beds are a great place to find this stuff. You never know when a marble will turn up. You never know if that marble that you find might be a really rare, really valuable valuable piece of American history. So, Vincent, thank you so much for having us out. We really appreciate it. And thank you for sharing with us your Marvel collection. We really appreciate that. And thank you guys for watching. Remember, you can follow all of our adventures on our YouTube channel, Chasing History. If you haven't, go on there and subscribe. Please subscribe. If you enjoyed this episode or any other episode, share those episodes. We've got a podcast. I know it's mind-blowing. We're doing so much. We've got a podcast called Chasing History. History Radio. It's available wherever you get your podcasts. We've got two 
awesome episodes with Benson on there talking about uh, Utah history, digging dumps, and um, the uh, the uh, Mormon Floyd. War. Yeah, Camp Floyd, the Mormon War. So be sure to check those out. We appreciate you guys. Oh, Benson, uh, are you on Twitter? Do you do Twitter? Uh, you, you know what Twitter? Yeah, I know about Twitter. Okay, but you, why, why don't you do Twitter? I don't know. I just never signed up. <laughs> See, he even Benson knows. Twitter is awful. We will never, ever, ever be on Twitter. You can follow us on Facebook. Follow us anywhere. We'll never be on Twitter. Remember, guys, history rocks. Woohoo!